All right, here with Wes Goldberg, editor-in-chief of All You Can Heat and host of the Locked On Heat podcast. Wes, thank you so much for taking your time with me this season. I really do appreciate you hopping on. Yeah, Ryan, of course. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. Uh, What do you think is the most interesting thing about the Miami Heat right now, other than maybe just being involved in a bunch of trade rumors? It's how they respond to coming out of those trade rumors, having not done any of those trades, isn't it? Like. All these yeah. guys, or a lot of these guys, were uh, either very much a part of those trade discussions in the case of somebody like Tyler Hero and even Kyle Lowry. Uh, and other guys were a little bit on the periphery, were wondering if they were going to be thrown in into some sort of bigger deal, whether you're a Caleb Martin, Duncan Robinson, the young guys like uh, Nikola Jovic, who's going into his second year, rookie Jaime Hakas Jr. Like uh, this whole team didn't really know where it stood going into even media day. And then on media day, we get the report that the Heat were even trying to get in on the Drew Holiday stuff after the Damian Lillard stuff. And who knows what that would have involved, but likely, again, a lot of the same players that we just mentioned. So um, this team is largely the same as it was last year, although we'll get to some of the key differences here between last year's finals teams and this one. Uh, But even more than just sort of bringing back that relatively same group, the dynamics in that team has, it just feels like it's changed a little bit. Having been around them in training camp, it's just, you could tell like, it's like, okay, does the team have faith in us? Do the fans have faith in us and all this kind of stuff. And so, yeah, you can say that adds a chip on their shoulder, but I just think that the dynamics within the organization with, w- between the players and all these things, that to me is what, what I'm watching right now. It does feel like over the course of these last three or so years that the Heat have been on the periphery of just about every star trade that you could you could ask for, whether it was Bradley Beal or Damian Lillard or Giannis back in the day. There, there's plenty of different names I think you could throw out there that the Heat have been rumored for. And I, I wonder, and then just some of the reaction that, that Tyler Hero seemed to have and that other guys in those trade proposals uh, coming back to the team again for for this time around how do you recreate that magic i think is a fair question after being in so many talks over the season is the team you think not not necessarily chemistry issues but is like you said that there may not be the same spark yeah and look you they have pretty much brought back the same team now three years in a row you mentioned some of the names that they've been trying to get you can add kevin durant and donovan mitchell into the mix last summer too right uh, they were even involved in maybe some possible KD discussions uh, before the trade deadline, before we was obviously moved to Phoenix. So there's been sort of this um, this impression from the front office's actions that they think that they need to add another superstar, right? Like this is not a team that they're like, okay, we're pretty much good to go. Let's just make some changes on the margins here, some marginal additions, and uh, and we should be good to go ahead and win a championship. I think in an honest moment, they would even be, they would even tell you that they were surprised by last year's run to the finals after getting in as a playing team. So um, this is a team that's been wanting to make a big move and has failed to make a big move for at least two years now. And, um, and, and yeah, I think when you sort of, sort of bring back the same basic team for three years in a row, the same core, things could get stale. And I think that's the fear. And I think that's kind of what I was feeling in the regular season too. And what this team was feeling in the regular season last year when they won just 44 games and then all of a sudden everybody sparked in the postseason. Maybe all of it, t- maybe all it takes to get excited about playing basketball together again is playoff basketball stakes. Uh, but there's no guarantee of making the playoffs, right? We know that the heat know that very well now, probably better than they did this time last year after barely making it as a play in team. So they need to find that spark, how they find that spark. Who knows? Again, maybe it's sort of the chip on their shoulder of the nobody believes in us thing again. Um, but they need to find it. You mentioned basically the same team you're bringing back, whether it's obviously Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo is going to be your core guys. Tyler Hero comes back after being in trade rumors, but uh, you've got some other names that are still back. Caleb Martin, Kyle Lowry. Uh, there, there's some other guys off the bench, including Kevin mm-hmm. Love, but two names in particular that are not there, Max Struess and Gabe Vincent after losing them in free agency. Uh, wondering just whether you think the new additions, whether it's, Josh Richardson, or, or maybe some internal improvements from uh, somebody like Nikola Jovic could really help offset that? Or is that a concern heading into the season for you guys? It's got to be a concern, but I don't think it's as big of a concern as I, I think some people think it is. Uh, yes, 
Gabe Vincent and Max Struess were the starting backcourt for the NBA Finals team, but they weren't the starting backcourt for most of the regular season. For most of the season, it was Kyle Lowry and Tyler Hero, and both of those guys are still there. They did add Josh Richardson, like you mentioned, who could play either the point or the the, the two guard spot for them. Um, this offense basically runs through Bam Adebayo and Jimmy Butler anyway, so you don't really need a traditional point guard if you want to kind of go in an alignment without one, which they can do. Um, so yeah, I think this will be. Uh, Tyler Hero stepping up and being better than he was the last couple of years, and by the, and I think that'll be the case. I think he was very good the last two years, twenty point per game score, and he keep, he continues to get better every single year. And I think you'll see that again. Um, is Kyle, can Kyle Lowry? They kind of figured out something last year with his minutes reduction. Let's play him like twenty twenty five minutes off the bench. We can kind of manage his health that way. I I think they'll you'll see something similar to that this year. And then Josh Richardson knows the system. He knows the team. He's a plug and play guy. 36% career shooter, which is right around what Max Struess is, even though Max Struess is sort of considered like this elite shooter. Like percentage-wise, Josh Richardson's right there with Max Struess, so, uh, and better than Gabe Vincent. So I actually think from a three-point shooting perspective, they'll be better because also, keep in mind, like last regular season, they were the worst three-point shooting team in the league out of all the teams that were actively trying to win games, right? Like they were the worst. And two years right. ago, when they were the number one seed, they were the best team in the league by three-point shooting percentage. They're probably not as good as they were two years ago, right? They're not, they're not the best three-point shooting team in the league. They're also not the worst three-point shooting team in the league. They'll probably settle somewhere right in the middle, um, and then that'll help really offset um, the losses of Max Struess and Gabe Vincent because they did, they did provide some other things, but mostly what they did was space the floor around Jimmy and Bam, and that's really the goal when you're a role player on the Heat right now. And Duncan Robinson's still coming off the bench. Yes. You've got Jaime Jaquez, who hasn't been mentioned at all, and there are some other interesting... Uh, possible additions like a Thomas Bryant who will be a good regular season player for them. Uh Haywood Highsmith, Orlando Robinson kind of in the background. But I'm I'm curious whether you think those kinds of additions and maybe some of this internal improvement, like how does that affect the disparity between, hey, the regular season success, team won 44 games last year, seventh in the East. Uh and then they go all the way to the NBA Finals. And this is a team that's been to either the Conference Finals or NBA Finals for three of the last four seasons. How does one parse that? How does one parse the difference between this kind of average regular season team versus an elite playoff team? Yeah, you can even go further back to when they acquired Jimmy Butler that first year uh, in the summer of 2019. This is typically a team that in the regular season wins between 40 and 45 games. Uh, in the regular season, they they have one outlier year where they won uh, 54 games, I believe it was, when they were the one seed two years ago. That was the outlier, right? right? Usually this team is just slightly above 500 in the regular season. Of course, they went to the finals two out of those three years that we were talking about when they won, you know, between 40 and 45 games. So um, I do think that there's something to the idea that the Heat are more built for the playoffs than they are the regular season. What I will push back on and have pushed back on basically since this became a talking point was the Heat have figured it out. They don't even care about the regular season. It's all about the playoffs. Trust me, the Heat would much have rather been the number one seed last year than the number eight seed and have to play the play-in tournament. Their goal this year is to not be in the play-in tournament. They value the regular season in, in a way that, hey, this is how we're going to learn our team, get better, make the changes that we need, and get ready to be that playoff juggernaut that we've basically been for, for the last four years. Um, but the regular season is a big part of that process. But in doing that process, you got to win more basketball games than, than you won right. last year. And that's, and talking with people at training camp, they're like, yeah, we need to figure out how to be closer to what we were the second half of last year and in the playoffs than what we were in the first half of last year, um, where they were just sort of disorganized. They weren't making a lot of shots. And I thought that put them in a little bit of a funk. They got to figure out how to just win more games in the regular season so that they could be clearly in the top six in the Eastern Conference and avoid the play-in altogether. I think that's completely fair. And I think the top six is a reasonable spot to yeah. to think about where this team can go. I, th I think the East overall, it looks like they're like the East is probably in for a down year outside of a couple of teams at the top. Uh, I have this team winning 43 games and being the sixth seed in the East. And that seems kind of disparate with kind of having a Western Conference perspective where I think maybe there's there's as many as 10 teams in the Western Conference that could really be above 500. Uh, 43 games could do it. Like it, it could be just fine. And, and I don't know if Miami is going to really have to stress themselves out too much in order to get out of that play in tournaments. But I have them at about 43 wins. Where do you think you see them? Most of the over-unders have, have it at 46 and a half. And I think it's a really good number for Miami. Um, I, 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 I'm 
probably closer to you. I, I, I kind of keep settling in around like 45 wins. So, you know, two, two game difference between you and I. Um, but yeah, I think that that's where this team will be. I think they've got a lot of things to figure out. You know, you mentioned some of the guys that they lost. What's the, what's the best rotation going to be? Um, they're still very much trying to figure things out. Uh, I think this is a team that can look a lot of different ways at a lot of different times this season. I also think that Jimmy Butler, I, I don't think that the 65 game minimum for NBA awards is going to matter. You know, he played 64 games last year for Miami. He wouldn't have qualified. The other part of that is that those, those are the most amount of games in the regular season he's ever played in a Miami Heat uniform. I don't wow. think he plays 64 games this year for the Heat. Yeah. So you got to sort of build in, all right, what do we do for 30 games at least without Jimmy Butler uh, or 20 games without Jimmy Butler? Um, I think that's a real thing that they got to figure out. So, um, yeah, I think 45 wins is, is, is typically you know, where I settle in on their, on their win-loss over-under. I think that's completely fair. Um, but the real question with this team isn't necessarily about the regular season wins. As long as they get in, as long as you get them in the dance, then they, they have the potential to, to upset some teams, or maybe it's not even an upset if you've got playoff Jimmy on your side. So what, what is it going to take this time around for this team to go deep in the playoffs once again? A couple things. Number one, you, you got to make your threes the way that they did last year. They, 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 as much as they struggled from three-point range in the regular season, something clicked in the playoffs and they made everything. So that was a big help. Uh, obviously, Jimmy Butler doing Jimmy Butler things. That's sort of the, if, if, if it's like a three-pronged prong, approach, those are the first two prongs. Make your threes, let Jimmy Butler turn to Michael Jordan for a couple months, and then go from there, right? <laughs> uh, the third part of this is you got to get the bracket to break right. Very obviously, Boston and Milwaukee in whatever order are the top two teams in the East, and it's not very close between those two teams and everybody else. You kind of, after that, got this like mushy kind of gray area that includes Philadelphia, Miami, Cleveland, the Knicks, Brooklyn, maybe Toronto, maybe like the, all these teams that are sort of in there. Maybe you're really high on Indiana. You could throw them in there too. Um, but you have, no, I have no idea where those teams are going to finish Cleveland. I don't know if you mentioned that they're in there too. Um, so whatever, like, but the other thing about Milwaukee and Boston is in making these big trades that again, I think make them the favorites in the conference that could hurt them in the regular season, right? Like, Guys are going to miss games. I don't know that they have a ton of depth. Like, they can lose a lot of games because of injuries to their star players because they just don't really have that depth. So I, I wouldn't just uh, just sort of in Sharpie say that Boston and Milwaukee are going to finish one and two in the East in the regular season when it's all said and done. Like, if they could very, like, one of them could finish first and one of them can finish with the four seed and they end up on the same side of the bracket. The reason I bring all of this up, Ryan, is because Miami's best case scenario to make a deep playoff run is that one of those teams knocks the other one out before yeah. the Heat have to face them, right? And then that way you only have to really face one of them, perhaps even as late as the Eastern Conference Finals, which would qualify as a deep playoff run. So those are sort of the three-pronged approach. It's get, be healthy and have your identity ready for the playoffs. Everybody catches fire from three-point range in the postseason. Jimmy Butler goes nuclear, Super Saiyan, whatever it is, and then and you, you catch a break in, in the way that the bracket plays out. I currently have this team as a first-round exit, and that to me feels pretty scary given the fact that that has not really borne out in, in three of the last four seasons and you can go back and look through the history of teams and, and fans not counting or they're counting out the heat pretty consistently and the heat continue to prove them wrong. So uh, obviously I'm, I'm a nuggets guy most mostly and got to see the heat up and up close and personally, they gave Denver the best challenge defensively. That's for sure. Uh, they made Denver work for it. So I hope to see the Heat back again in the finals. How cool would that be? <laughs> it would be very cool. It'd be great to go back to Denver for a few days. Um, it would be very surprising again, just like it was last year too. Who knows? Who knows? You, you never know, Wes, but he is Wes Goldberg at WC Goldberg on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it. Uh, make sure to follow his work at Locked on Heat. All you can eat, all you can heat. He's the editor in chief over there. Wes, thank you so much for coming on, man. Thanks, Ryan.